This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best selling book What School Could Be. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be podcast. I'm your host, Josh Rapoon. This is the first in a series of special episodes that come from the Big Think Speaker series in the whatschoolcouldbe.org archives. Keep in mind the audio comes from Zoom calls, so expect a couple of bumps and knocks. On the other hand, the conversations you will hear are incredible for their depth and insight into what school could be. Stephen Ritz is an internationally acclaimed award-winning educator. He is the author of the best-selling book, Power of the Plant founder of the Green Bronx Machine in New York City, and is responsible for creating the first edible classroom in the entire world. His students have grown more than 165,000 pounds of vegetables in the South Bronx alone, but ask him if he's the quote, plant guy, and he'll tell you very firmly, he's the quote, school guy. In this fascinating conversation, hosts Capono Ciotti and Susanna Johnson dig in with Stephen Ritz to explore a new model for education, one rooted in compassion, a holistic view of children, the overall wellness in our society, and yes, plants, lots of plants. And now, here is a conversation with the remarkable, the insightful, the epic Stephen Ritz. Take it away, Kapono and Susanna. To this amazing game changer. My name is Kapono. I am executive director of What School Could Be, and I'm joined by my co host, Susanna Johnson. Hi, Susanna. How are you? Hi, Kapono. I'm so excited to be here and so thrilled. This is fun. I am going to very quickly get to the point here, and I'm going to introduce um, Stephen Ritz. I'm going to do a little formal introduction of him first. Stephen is an internationally acclaimed, award winning educator, author of the best selling book, Power of the Plant, uh, one of my favorite books and founder of The Green Bronx Machine, one of my favorite uh, educational nonprofits. He is known as America's favorite teacher and in 2015 was a top 10 finalist for the Global Teacher Prize. Uh, he's responsible for creating the first edible classroom in the entire world. Uh, his students have grown more than 165,000 pounds of vegetables in the South Bronx alone. Uh, they were celebrated at the Obama White House no less than three times. They've been featured on the cover, cover of Times for Kids. Uh, and are the subject of a new full feature documentary, Generation Growth. Um, really cool to know a replica of his classroom was installed in the U.S. Botanical Gardens in D.C. And its curriculum is being used at hundreds of schools across the United States and internationally, from Colombia to Dubai, from Canada to Cairo, the school that I, I am associated with in uh, Cairo, Egypt, the American International School, shout out to AIS, um, to Doha and beyond. Um, Steven's uh, TED Talk boasts over a million views, uh, and I could go on and on and on. And I will say, uh, finally, on his introduction, that Steven is a good friend of mine. And I am appreciative that while he is in the middle of the night in Germany and um, have had a really long day, that he's uh, taken the time uh, to come and spend uh, this hour with us. Steven, welcome. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is showing up is very powerful. I say that to teachers, I say that to colleagues, I say that to students every day. Half the battle is getting there. Bring your body and your brain will follow. So I'm bringing my body, Uh, the brain is in the room, and uh, let's get this party started. But an honor to be here. And a big shout out to you, Capono, for all the work that you are doing um, across many continents. But we can get into that a little later. Yeah, for sure. I want to start here is, um, you know, you, you started Green Bronx Machine um, and you've you've really made a national and international impact with uh, you know green education, sustainable education. You know, to a certain extent, those are you know catchphrases and educational jargon. Um, but what you do is certainly much more than that. Why is this work important beyond just those titles, green, sustainable? What's the core of this work that you're doing? Listen, I, I mean, the name of our organization is Green Bronx Machine, but I tend not to use those words green and sustainable. Let me be clear. I am not the garden guy. I'm not the salad guy. I'm not the plant guy. 
I am the school guy. And what I mean by that is that the greatest lever this nation and communities like mine have is public education. And for me, the most important thing is high performing schools. Now, there are a lot of things that go into creating a high performing school, pedagogy, leadership, culture. But at the heart of it, and particularly in marginalized communities, and now more than ever in hungry communities, food is tantamount. I've always said that, you know, children will never be well read if they're not well fed. Um, the most important school supply in the world is food. And, and let me say that again. The most important school supply in the world is food. Try teaching a child who is hungry. I have kids who go home on Friday and if not for school food and if not for us, don't eat again till Monday. So when they come back in and saying, oh, you know, sit down, time to take out your reading and let's dialogue this section. Uh, they've got bigger concerns and rightfully so. So food is absolutely critical. Then there's the public health crisis, uh, diabetes, um, juvenile obesity. Uh, you know, we've got we've seen the onset. I, I'm, I'm a lot older than I look. I'm aging gracefully. And we've seen the onset of childhood puberty go down year after year. Um, and that's largely because of the milk, the meats, the cheese, the salt and the sugar. These young people are taxing their bodies on ways that are absolutely aging them exponentially. So food is at the intersection of everything. Now, you throw in a climate crisis, global food issues, you know, why is it that communities that are least responsible um, for all the problems feel the greatest burden of it? Um, so that's, you know, I'm an equity warrior, make no doubt about it. I'm an equity warrior first. I have a fundamental belief that children should not have to leave their neighborhoods to live, learn, and earn in a better one. And that's what drives me. It's about high performing schools. It's about engaged teachers and not only engagement, really fulfillment. Because, you know, look, we're all administrators. We always want to walk in and see the kids engaged. And we learned that over COVID, they were engaged. They were engaged on TikTok for 10 hours a day doing nothing. I want teachers and children who are fulfilled, who have passion, who have purpose, who have hope and who have meaning. And with that, everything changes. So that that's the work that I do. And I'm able to do it through the ability to grow copious amounts of food, which is totally cool because in a community that has limited means and limited access to it, growing food is a license to print money. It's an opportunity to create entrepreneurship. It's a lens into parents and community and health an opportunity. So it has been game changing, but you don't hear me use the word green and you'll never hear me use the word sustainable. Um, because listen, <laughs> after 30 years of marriage, if I were to tell you my marriage is sustainable, <laughs> that's not really where I want to be. I like <laughs> words like restorative, regenerative. And that's what this education is a process is all about getting kids to take ownership, voice and choice and do something in the world that will ultimately leave it a little bit better than they found it before we all spontaneously self combust. One of my educational uh, leader colleagues um, used to use this framework around if a kid is struggling in school, that the first place we should start is physiological. That we yes. need to look at nutrition. Is the kid, you know, hey. full? Has he eaten? Has he eaten healthy food? And is there a stomach ache? Is there uh, does the kid need glasses? The physiological, and then you go to the social emotional, and then to the academic intervention beyond that. And only in that order do we really get at really serving kids well. That that feels really true for me, um, specifically in some of the indigenous and native Hawaiian communities that I'm working in here in Hawaii. That idea that Jack in the Box and 7-Eleven are where many of our community members go to for food, that that's not where you go to to be nurtured. It's certainly where you go to get calories and inexpensive calories. Uh, but Whole Foods doesn't go into neighborhoods uh, like those that I'm working in here. If those foods aren't available, then how, how does this, 
how does the community go about doing what you do? I mean, it's not just easy to say, okay, tomorrow we're going to yeah. grow 165,000 pounds of food in my neighborhood. Yeah. What, what is, yeah. How does What's that happen? Step one. <laughs> There's a step one is to commit. I always say that you got to decide to make a difference. Now, you, you hit the nail on the head. Cheap and convenient is slow and deadly. It's costing us a fortune. And, you know, we've got to, number one, stop treating marginalized communities as epicenters of profit. And in my community, most kids outside of school get their food in a gas station, a bulletproof bodega, a drugstore. That's criminal. We've got the clown, the king in the corner on every corner, right next to the liquor store and the dialysis center. If we really want to talk about communities in the United States that have the highest care cost of health care, you got to look at food. Food is the number one source. When you look at cities, no biological function in the world contributes more to stress on cities than the use, the distribution, and the consumption of food. So for me, food justice is racial justice. Who has access to what, where, when, and at what price determines everything. And even during the pandemic, you know, we opened up the schoolyard during the pandemic so kids could play. It was that hot, 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 hot summer. And we're outside and we're playing tag and kids wanted to join. And I was great. So we got some new kids in the schoolyard. And at the end, you know, we're going back in. Someone says, yo, Mr. Ritz, can you buy me a soda? And my students turned around and said, what? Asking Mr. Ritz for your soda is like asking your mama for a cigarette. Ask him for water. Ask him. Ice tea, ask him for a piece of fruit. Don't ever, 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 ever ask Miss Duritz for a soda. And frankly, that day, my work was done. It happens one child at a time, one classroom at a time. How would I gain weight one pound at a time? How would I lose it one pound at a time? Um, that's what this work is about. Meaningful change in front of children where they take ownership. I appreciate the small steps and, and you really got into this in terms of the one step, but also you're, you're moving us into this, the metaphor for everything that you do, which is this growth mindset. So for me, I'm, I'm so excited. You're talking about harmony of our own bodies and harmony with the planet and harmony. Education is the, the playground for that and is the soil for that, right? But I was um, thinking about the fact that you had stated in something that I, I read or watched about when a seed doesn't grow, we don't blame the seed or even the farmers, that we blame the soil and the conditions for growth. And I'm thinking about that all the time in terms of the metaphors for what we're doing with schools and how we're trying to change schools. So with what you've reimagined and, and what the, all the work that you've done that started so long ago, you've actually shifted an entire community and one of the most challenging communities of our country, right? One of the poorest, one of the most, uh, the biggest food deserts that we have economically, um, and also was prior to all of this evolution, one of the lowest performing school districts as well and, and communities. And yet now, in addition to everybody having a connection to their community, everybody having a connection to healthier, better food for their lives and for their bodies, um, for their learning practices, but also you've got a higher performing school than a lot of our, your neighboring districts. And so Across I'm just the curious. Country, we have yeah. 675 schools in marginalized communities yeah. that outperform their peer index neighbor on all of the 10 school okay. performance indicators. And we've got something that's remarkable. 100% teacher satisfaction. Um, that's that's an amazing statistic. 94% of the children who come through the program want to do it again. But you touched on something, and that's really what I call the power of a plant. And, you know, when you put a seed in the ground, and I wrote about this in the book, The Power of a Plant, and that seed doesn't thrive, we don't blame the seed. We look at the conditions around too much water, too not enough water, crappy soil, bad light, too much light, too hot, too cold. When children don't thrive in school, we are so quick to blame the child. We're so quick to label the child. We never look at the conditions. In a lot of ways, we give plants more respect than we give children. But at the end of the day, children and these big ideas are the biggest seeds imaginable. Um, so, you know, I always say the deeper you plant me, you better watch out, baby, because, you know, I'm going to grow. You, you bury me. You better be careful what you put on top of me um, because I am determined to find the sun and seek the light. And, and that's what this work is about. You know, no child rises to low expectations. You know, kids don't, in my community, go through the trials and tribulations and often the dangerous settings of the community to get to school to not be engaged. 
Um, yes, we've got to send them. Yes, parents push them out the door. Yes, there's a daycare piece involved. And there's everything else. But I really believe the children want to thrive, that they really want to be inspired. And, and, and growing plants, especially plants that grow quickly and doing hands-on project-based learning is one of the biggest ways to get sticky, sticky experiences. And, and what do those sticky experiences look like? It looks like something they can take home with them at the end of the day or utilize that period. I mean, telling a kid in a community that has 25% unemployment and only 10% of all parents with a high school diploma that if you come to school for four months, you sit there, you do your homework, you play nice, you know, you'll get an A or you'll get a good grade on your report card. Wow. I don't think I'd stick around for four months, any of that. But you've got to kind of make the cycle of rewards closer and the payoff far greater. And one of the things that I'm most proud of in our community is 2,200 living wage jobs. That's how I cut my chops um, is by having credibility in my community. Um, You know, we are a mighty workforce development program in a city that pays millions for people who do two or three percent incremental change. Um, So we are the ones we're waiting for. Um, you know, in a community that didn't, didn't have a table, we're building our own kitchen and our own farm, and we're making it bigger, rounder, and longer, and inviting everyone to join us. I, I love that so much, and I also want to just point to the equity factor because of what you're talking about and being where all of these schools are and, and how they are performing against other ones. We often talk about how challenging it is to work with these communities that have so many difficulties, right? Generational poverty and um, food deserts and all of that. We talk about how hard that is, but when I think about these changes, I think about how many districts that are in more affluent neighborhoods and higher performing or private schools um, and how they say, oh, we can't change because it's too hard to make these changes or our communities or our families don't want it. And so what, what would be the thing that you would say to them? Because my answer is simply, duh, look at, what's happened with Green Bronx Machine as well as all of these other amazing schools all over the world and how much that has changed stuff. But how do you get some of these mindsets to shift around it, um, to bring the community on board, to say, we're gonna trust you to, to do something as radical as you know grow food um, and make your kids healthier and make kids more engaged. We're gonna trust you to do that because we know for sure it's gonna have a good outcome. What do you, how, do you, how do you talk to them with that? Or how can we give them some I advice? Use this amazing word. It's called evolution. Um, You know, people evolve. You know, I jokingly say on the evolutionary chart of man, I'm just trying to get closer to the right side from the left and hoping my knuckles don't scrape the ground in the process. But I think nothing changes if nothing changes. And more often than not, listen, I was a dean of students for years. And you could go in and into a disruptive class or get involved with the kids in conflict. And the first thing you want to do is what happened? And everyone starts the blame game. I don't like the blame game. The blame game gets me nowhere. Uh, so like the blame game, you know, I don't play that. I play the how do we get to better game. So like the first thing, I'll walk into a crazy situation in school back then. And understand, I worked in a school that had 256 felonies. We were pulling guns and knives and weapons off kids. Uh, We had 18 police officers in this school, 48 school safety agents, a $2 million a year budget dedicated to security with a a 17% graduation rate. So to me, that's just the epitome of dysfunction. And you can go in there and say, it's your fault and I'm going to be you. But how do you get to better? So you ask these open-ended questions. Who's hungry? Everybody's hungry. What did you eat for breakfast? And more often than not, it was crap or no breakfast. So you invite these opposing forces to come in and share a meal. Now, back then, for me, it was pizza and cheap food because that's what I knew and that was available. But that's how you develop a culture where you come around the table um, instead of putting up bigger walls in every sense of the word. So, you know, I I invite people. Listen, my favorite toy as a child were my friends. Um, because we were all poor and, and no one had anything. So we had kids with unique talents. And I think that's what makes the world special, um, is embracing every child's unique talent, every child's unique voice, and, and welcoming that at a table that is going to collectively make our whole experience better. Or, if not better, at least for the moment, more tolerable. Um, because intolerable is unacceptable. A lot of the context in which we've been talking about so far is a context of challenge. Uh, 
and certainly is a reality and it certainly is the the un uh the nutrient deficit metaphorical soil uh that we've we've put out there as a context for our school system for all of us that that's the context we work in so i'm glad we're addressing it beyond that i've seen you work with kids and i have not felt kids experience that deficit i have not felt kids experience holy crap you know this is 17% graduation rate holy crap you you don't have nutrition i've seen you work with kids and i've seen kids only experience an asset based lens what do you what do you do i mean so you definitely ask the question how do we get to better but what's in what's in this green sustainable plant seed growing thing that's so special that when i watch your work i only see kids see possibility and hope i think that there's a secret to the sauce and let me be clear this work is hard it is really hard even in great schools the work is hard and, and this work requ- requires courage but the opposite of courage is not cowardice in school the opposite of courage in school is conformity because even a dead fish can go with the flow and in the south bronx we are not dead fish we are swimming um i think the young people that i meet in egypt in your schools they are not dead fish they are swimming they understand that the world is inherently unfair but offers a lot of beauty and they would rather have more beauty in their lives than unfair than anger and it, and it's my job to shepherd them there to a better brighter place you know look i am no genius let me be clear i've been asked to graduate elsewhere and work elsewhere for a bunch of reasons but I do bring my A game every day. I show up, I work hard, and my goal is to get everyone to a better place. And I think when people understand that, they do want to be in a better place. But it's about being present, it's about listening. Obviously, I'm doing a lot of talking here. I do a lot of talking, but when I'm with children, I really do a lot of listening. And the skill to listening is to hear, not listening to respond. So many teachers they want to listen to respond. Sometimes you just got to let a kid have their day and listen and say thank you and say thank you for sharing and let it sit with them and let it sit with you and live in a place of suspended judgment. You know, as an administrator, I've walked into how many times you go into evaluate teachers in a snapshot moment, you see something great that turns out to be horrible. You see something horrible that was just an awkward moment. Right now, this is not me picking my nose. It's me moving my glasses. But in a split second, it could look like I'm picking my nose. So I've learned to suspend judgment. And, and I think these are the things that if we teach children and we teach ourselves, it's a collective best practice that cre- creates a culture of support. And that's really what it's all about. It's okay not to be okay in my class, but every day I'm going to ask you what can I do to help you? And what can you tell me that's going to help me help you? So we're not afraid to ask for help. Um I think that's really important. I take great pride in, you know, being approachable. I think one of the things that has really stuck out to me in in watching you work and seeing the program that you have uh helped inspire continue even without you on the campus with the kids is how how soil water whatever the the nutrient substrate is and that that growth of the plant short circuits the antagonistic situation uh, relationship that schools set up between uh teacher and student i mean so um you know uh AIS and and a couple schools that i have worked in and supported um have used the international baccalaureate right and uh pros and cons right i love the philosophy of international baccalaureate i think the 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 cast hours the the creativity activity and 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 uh service is brilliant i think the philosophy is wonderful but certainly those high stake tests of the d- diploma program are no better than uh, ap tests or sat tests uh, in my humble opinion but one of the things that i've seen set up so well in international baccalaureate programs um because of that high stakes external test um and oddly in, in british programs as well or french programs is when you're preparing kids for that big bad thing you get to be their coach rather than their coach today and the opposing team tomorrow like so in in a traditional american school program i i i'm coaching them today i i'm uh I'm at the front of the classroom maybe delivering something. I'm I'm facilitating some group work. 
And then at the end of the semester, I'm the arbitrator, the opposing team, and the referee saying how well you did. You're playing me. Turn in your test to me. I will grade your final exam to me. Share your learning to me, and I will be the arbiter of how quality your work is. And while, you know, I, obviously, if you know me, you know I find tons of flaws in a French baccalaureate system or a British system or an IB system or an AP system. There's this like magic that happens when you are the true coach and you get to coach your team all the way to the finals uh, against whatever that is, right? And it would kind of be like, let's, let's extend that metaphor, right? If, you, if I was coaching a, 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 an actual athletic team, which I have for most of my educational life, I get to coach them and then they get to go play the big game. Uh, if I coached them and then they comp competed against me, that would be a really different dynamic. Uh, I don't know that I would have a lot of kids left on my team. So let me get to the point here. I think one of the things that I've seen magical in the programs that I've seen you create is the plant somehow short circuits that antagonistic relationship between the teacher and the student. And all of a sudden we're on the same team. And there's it's not about control or more knowledge or less knowledge it's a i don't what what is that stephen ritz what is that what it's have i experienced we're all part of an ecosystem it's not us versus them it's not me versus you it's we listen i'm a competitive athlete uh, that's why i'm in elementary school at my age because i'm determined to re, you know retire undefeated uh so you know you're nothing like you know a, a six foot two 70 year old posting up on a first grader um but you know i'm gonna win but i'm not in it to win I'm in it so that we all win. And even though I coach and I coach kids for just about everything, including sports, I'm not coaching them for the game. I'm coaching them for after the game. It's a very different mindset. I'm coaching. And, you know, let's talk about those big stakes and high stake tests and all that other crap that, you know, we've become beholden to. Did anybody notice during COVID kids got into college without the college boards? Uh, or is that my the only one who happened to notice that that, you know, rich kids still got into school uh, and poor kids were able to get into school. And then let's talk about something else for kids who had access to the Internet. You know, wow, they were able to set their own background. Uh, they were able to come to class when they wanted to turn and work at their own schedule. And for kids who had the support and felt it, they were able to do it. Holy crap, that's enough to make my teacher organization card of my Delaney book spontaneously self combust. <laughs> what about my cheating seating chart, man? Um, you know, so you know, it's it's got to be less about me and more about the we. And, and that's what this is now more than ever. It really is. You know, I, I talk about kids and in, in communities like mine. Look, I, I'm an older guy. I'm the oldest guy on this call. And, and I say that with some grace and dignity. And when I was a young boy, I came up in the civil rights movement, I was very impacted by the civil rights movement. And I saw my elders, you know, they were they were fighting for equality. You know, there were two water fountains. Now we're fighting for existence because at least in the 50s and 60s, both water fountains gave you drinkable water um, in black and brown communities. Now there is no water. So we've gone from fighting for equality to fighting for our lives right. in so many ways, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not only are we under-resourced, we're over-extracted. And, and think about what that means. I mean, every single thing comes to us in a plastic Ziploc single-serve bag designed to for a transaction as opposed for a cycle. Right. The, the coolest thing, you know, that happens in my with my plants in school is when they die. Um, usually because, you know, something happens and, you know, I get to sing the circle of life, which really goes over with those big, hairy, you know, high school kids. They just want yeah. another round of that, please, <laughs> Mr. before they shoot me. But that's understanding what this is. There, there There's no guarantees in life. And, and so often, you know, we think that if you do this, you're going to get that. And if you do, we've lost the humanity. Um, so I think, you know, plants put more human into our being and they teach us that we are part of a living, breathing, interconnected ecosystem, particularly in communities where kids are so divorced from it. And once you realize, you know, that, that we're just a little speck, but we can make a difference. Um, that's kind of cool. It's kind of really empowering for these little guys and big guys. And at the end of the day, it's, it's just a more dignified way to make a living. I, mean, I can't imagine any kid in high school really wanting to slave away behind the French fry machine at McDonald's. 
So when you offer them the opportunity to grow food or create a garden or create a great meal or do something fun and make a decent living at it, wow, that's totally cool. Because, Susanna, I'm going to bring it to you in, in, in one big circle. So obviously all of my students in the South Bronx are black and brown, um, you know, and, and there we are. And, you know, and we've got the clown, the king and the colonel on every corner trying to suck these kids dry for 99 cent meals. And we built it. And all of a sudden we got a new Wendy's. It was the Taj Mahal of Wendy's, man, <laughs> right in the middle of the South Bronx. This this big red glittering superdome of hamburger dome, you know, and, and a cute girl with dimples in the windows and, you know, and 99 cent frosties. <laughs> and we have been working with kids to teach them about growing tomatoes. And if you weren't aware, um, Wendy's refused to pay the tomato farmers one penny more per pound for the tomatoes. And the kids got so upset with that um, because, first of all, a penny isn't a lot of money. But it was so hard for them to grow tomatoes in class and, you know, to pollinate them. And, to, and they wouldn't pay a penny more. So the kids are like, that's not fair. And as a parent, you know, often we don't want to hear that's not fair because it's my house, my rules. It's a teacher. My name's on the door. I'm on the program, not you. But when I hear that's not fair in my classroom, that is a call to action. That is like, dun, 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 dun. that's like the Rocky theme song for me. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's not fair. What are you going to do about it? So our kids have been boycotting Wendy's. You know, when they saw that the black and brown people who looked like their aunts and grandparents and uncles and brothers and siblings weren't getting a raise, they decided they weren't going to eat it at Wendy's anymore. And, you know, and that was a moral victory on so many levels, because every time I keep one of those burgers out of their belly, I'm doing them a favor, the planet a favor, the world a favor. And we're teaching children that their voice matters, that you vote with your mouth, you vote with your fork, you vote with your wallet. You don't have to give it away on some endless social media. Uh, you know, I, I don't care in my class who the Kardashians are dating. That That's not a subject of discussion in my class. It is absolutely irrelevant to me. Um, but, you know, we want to talk politics. Let's get involved. Um, yeah. Let's get involved. You know, and we're registering kids who register their parents and grandparents to vote. And it's about participatory democracy. And for me, that's what it, this is about. Participatory democracy. Um, and it starts with kids and it starts with voice. But it also involves some respect and dignity and rules for sure. Um, you know, I, my classes can be a little chaotic. They can be a little loud. But that's part of the process. Um, you know, it shouldn't be. Schools should no longer be neat, ordered rows. You don't need me for content. There's YouTube. There's Google. There's that's everything. Right. You need me to make sure everyone's playing nice and that we can figure it all out and get to a better place at the end. And that even if you lose, you can still win. And that there's always a tomorrow. When I think about what you're doing and what you're, all of these students are learning and what's been happening, the future is pretty easy to see because there's so many transferable skills. But do are you seeing that your students are feeling that same level of opportunity and what are some of the impacts and what, what are the future stuff that you're already seeing now that we could just shed some light on? So tomorrow morning at six o'clock in the morning, my time, whatever time that will be, I have a call with Fair Green International School in Miss Julie's class. The fourth graders who have a very profitable farm. I lent them $100 two years ago uh, to start this farm, and it's now profitable. They have an whole entrepreneurial model. So I'm very excited about figuring out when I can get my loan paid back. But, you know, the, the future of farming is, is very different, particularly in light of some of the challenges that we as society and the world are facing around resources, population explosion, and, you know, our ability to be decent guests on the planet. So, you know, let me be clear, an average greenhouse worker in the United States with two years worth of college or post high school experience can be making $85,000 a year. That's pretty impressive. You know, the ability to run your farm with this is a lot better than getting on a horse or a cow or an ox and, you know, being in the hot beating sun. The ability to grow copious amounts of food, hyper local, hyper connected uh, with no pesticides. Um, no transportation miles in a city on a former brownfield 
is absolutely the most wonderful thing we can do for our communities. Listen, to feed the next generation of people, we would need to have two times the land mass of China. And guess what? We just don't have it. So if we want to live, if we want to thrive, if we want to survive, much less thrive, we've got to really change our food production patterns and consumption. You know, I jokingly tell the kids, and it's not a joke, you know, without farmers, and we all like our clean socks and clean fuzzy underwear, without farmers, we'd all be naked and hungry. Um, so we need to farm, we need to grow food, and we need to put dignity back into it. And, and a lot of that has to do with inequities in the food system, um, which I can get into, which is a whole nother conversation, because the food system traditionally is not broken. Um, it's just designed, it's really doing well, concentrating power in the hands of a few at the expense of so, so many. So when you disrupt the food system and create your own, you're really doing something entirely new and, and, and something wonderfully disruptive. But it's really, you know, in terms of AI, listen, I got a kid, Andrew Bloom. He just hit Bill Gates up for $100 million. 25 years ago, he was the first grader of the month because he did a project on seeds and lima beans, which we all do. You know, I remember that project, you know. Um, so amazing things can happen. You know, science is true, whether you believe it or not. So the more that we, you know, dedicate ourselves to that in pursuit of, you know, the more we're going to liberate ourselves as a society. And, and what it boils down to is justice. Um, because the degree to which we resist any injustice is the degree to which we are all free. And traditional colonized societies and colonial work and slavery and colonialism are really rooted in injustice. But, you know, on a farm where you don't have to be big and strong, you could just be smart and present. That's a great equalizer. Bridget commented and just thanked you for, for that comment. She grew up on a farm and her father and grandfather uh, were not respected by the white collar IBM working class type that lived in the area. The conversations have been popping up more and more around that big tent idea that you, you said, Stephen. Could we live in a less polarized society by addressing people's needs rather than uh, pitting people's needs against each other? For example, we talked about the, the colonizing nature of coming into small rural schools with one agenda, with the tech agenda, with the uh, digital agenda, with the urban agenda. Um, and what does it feel like if I am from a rural community um, are you coming in and are, is your educational agenda supporting my community thriving, my family thriving, me on my land thriving, me and my way of life thriving? Is it, is it supporting that or is it supporting what I feel and perceive and actually is the decimation of my community um, for 100%. the benefit of an urban society? We were talking about it's not a tech or non-tech conversation. It's not an ag or not ag conversation. It's and, and, and. It's what hmm. gets us all to a better place. Listen, we could feed the poor and clothe the naked tomorrow. We could end hunger and poverty today. We just can't satisfy the rich. And we need to understand that. You know, so I, I put my cards very much on the table. You know, we could end hunger tomorrow. We just can't satisfy the rich. That's what this is all about. And we've got to stop colonizing and polarizing communities. We've got to think how we could be better guests on earth rather than owners of it and other things. And, you know, part of what I think I do really well with kids, um, particularly your schools, listen, you know, I, I'm nothing more than a kind of fly by night visitor is that I teach them that we don't own things. They own us. I kind of come in with a spirit. I kind of translate that spirit to kids. I get them excited. Um, I kind of launch them in the stratosphere and then I leave a mess for you to clean up. Sorry, Capono. But, you know, I mean, what do I do? I leave them excited and ready to do something. And, and that's what we want. We want children to do something, you know, I mean, whether it's clean their room, you know, read another book, whatever it is, do something. And then when you give teachers tools that enable them to take that energy and excitement and focus it into a concrete hierarchical, hierarchical skill set that we can measure and evaluate and recursively um, monitor, that's school, that's education, that's pinpointing processes and procedures and getting everybody to a better place and having fun at the same time. And, and that's what I love to do. 
with the time kind of ticking down and about 10 minutes left, there was two things I wanted to talk about. I wanted to make sure we touch on the book, Power of the Plant, uh, you co-authored with friend of what school could be, Susie Boss. Um, and I want to kind of push into that next, if you wouldn't mind, you know, sharing a little bit about that, sharing, you know, why somebody might pick it up if they haven't. Tell us, tell sure. us about so, it. Why, yeah. why should we pick it up? What are we going to get out of All it? Right, so it's inspiration, perspiration, motivation, and how to. It is an American story. The book even has walk away actionable items, which is really great. It has a manifesto. And at the end of the day, you're going to laugh. We had 300 pages. Susie sends it to me. I print it out. I put it across my living room, my foyer, and my kitchen, 300 pages in order. Get out a scissor and scotch tape to scotch tape the book, to cut and paste with a scissor and tape what I wanted and didn't want it, glued it back together, took pictures and texted it back to Susie. And that's how the book was born. The book became a number one bestseller. You know, it's passion, it's purpose, it's hope. Um, please, you know, get a copy of the book. <laughs> School districts around America use it. They even got me out of my cheese hat and put me in a suit, which I've never worn to make me more palatable. But the book is our story. It's not my story. It's our story. It's, it's the story of every teacher who sits in front of children and is just determined to make their lives better and find a little dignity and self-respect for themselves in the process. So I, I couldn't be prouder of the book. I have a couple of more books planned, one of them including a tell-all, more to come on that. But um, yeah, 100% of the proceeds pro uh, support the program. You know, you buy this book, kids get to eat, we get to do cool things. So it's a very recursive cycle. And uh, yeah, get out and check out the book. And Susie has a great bunch of books. And Capono, you're writing a great book. You just written a great book. So tell us a little bit about yours. Oh, you're so kind. Landscape Model of Learning is out now. Uh, with my co-author, Jennifer Klein, who is also uh, Susie Boss, the connected uh, star between many of us. Yes, uh, yes. If y'all don't Susie. know Susie Boss and you're listening and you definitely got to check out her work. She's just been such an amazing educator and connector of uh, of minds and thoughts. I uh, really appreciate of her. process, yeah. man. Susie's right. about process. Yeah. Now, the amazing thing is, what is she, all of four foot eight and 90 pounds? <laughs> I know, yeah. She's really she comes to the middle of the South Bronx swinging a big pen and a heavy notebook, and she really gets down, and the kids love her. Um, so, she does. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, the, the overlap between Power of the Planet and Landscape Model of Learning would be the um, landscape and ecosystem metaphor, and certainly um, that idea put forth by so many amazing educators, and including what school could be, co-founder Ken Robinson, the idea that it is the the soil that we nurture, the conditions that we put in place to grow students, that this is much more like gardening than it is carpentry, is definitely a shared thesis between both of those books. Susanna, um, why don't I throw it to you for uh, a push into like, what do we do yeah. next? Always, we come around to this point in the conversation. We're all excited, we're all inspired, we're all there. And I wanna be that voice of every educator saying, step one, buy the books. Yeah, for sure. Definitely buy <laughs> Power of the Plant, buy Landscape of Learning, um, buy Susie's books. How do we how do we move into that next step? And what do educators do? What's the the small step that somebody could take right now beyond gathering this resource and paying attention to your work a little bit more? So no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. So I'm going to hit you with a commandment. Number one, do something today that you and your future self will thank you for. Number two, <laughs> be kind to yourself, to another person, and to the planet, and you'll be amazed what happens. Number three, we have great curriculum. Our Green Bronze Machine curriculum is used around the world, so you can order your curriculum from us as well, uh, including a garden. It is no annual fees, no tiered subscription. Is it a one-time, lifetime site license with unlimited professional development? And you can do something on a daily basis. Listen, love yourself a little better. And, and, and if COVID hasn't taught us to call our parents, to tell our children we love them, and to take time to look up and see the sun, I don't know what else to tell you. Put the screens down, fall in love, get out there and make epic happen, hold hands. You know, be a better partner, a better husband, a better wife, a better spouse. These are the things that we can do immediately. And you'd be amazed when you feel better, your kids feel better. And when your kids feel better, you feel better. It's kind of like, you know, that interconnected ecosystem. Put a plant in your classroom, um, you know, and, and stay connected. 
The beauty of social media for good is that, you know, you don't have to send me cat GIF videos. You can ask me a real meaningful question and I'll get back to you. The beauty is we can connect our classes. I literally, I'm online connecting kids around the world. I'll be on with Dubai at six in the morning um, before doing, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, we have the ability and the capacity to really reimagine everything that we do in a holistic and compassionate way. So let compassion be the new curriculum. Let empathy be your North Star. And remember, education, not asphyxiation. Breathe life and oxygen into everything that you do, and you'll have a much better life, and your kids will too. Well, I don't know that we could end on a more positive note than that. I will thank uh, my co-host, Susanna Johnson. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you. you. No, this is so thrilling. (laughs) And um, Stephen, I don't know that we've had a more positive game changer than this. You're just so inspiring. I'm watching the chat and seeing, uh, I think you've really change some trajectories today. Certainly brighten some days. That's why they call me the plant daddy, baby. Uh, you know, <laughs> listen, have fun with it. Um, unto you, Capono, I say mucho mahalo, and thank you for spreading all of that wonderful aloha all around the world. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Take care. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Not saying goodbye, but see you soon. See you soon, see you soon Stephen. These special episodes are edited by Kim Diltz and Evan Kurohara. Our theme music comes from the vast catalog of music created by my friend of 40 years, the remarkable pianist, Michael Sloan. Producer of 12 albums with over 100 songs, Michael Sloan is featured in Apple Music, Spotify, and all major music platforms. You can also find his work at his YouTube channel. Michael has listeners in over 100 countries and over 2,000 cities to date. Support these episodes with remarkable, innovative, and imaginative educators and education leaders by giving us your own rating and writing us a review at your favorite podcast store. Please join the What School Could Be global online community by going to community.whatschoolcouldbe.org or by downloading the What School Could Be app from your favorite app store. The What School Could Be podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Send your feedback to josh at whatschoolcouldbe.org. Follow the show on Twitter at WSCB Podcast. Until the next episode, ahui ho and take good care. <laughs>